Sir Thomas More, the 7th of February 1478 to the 6th of July 1535, venerated in the Catholic Church as Saint Thomas More, was an English lawyer, social philosopher, author, statesman, and noted Renaissance humanist. He was also a counselor to Henry VIII and Lord High Chancellor of England from October 1529 to the 16th of May 1532. He wrote Utopia, published in 1516, about the political system of an imaginary, ideal island nation. More opposed the Protestant Reformation, in particular the theology of Martin Luther and William Tyndale. More also opposed the king's separation from the Catholic Church, refusing to acknowledge Henry as supreme head of the Church of England and the annulment of his marriage to Catherine of Aragon. After refusing to take the oath of supremacy, he was convicted of treason and beheaded. Of his execution, he was reported to have said, I die the king's good servant, but God's first. Pope Pius XI canonized More in 1935 as a martyr. Pope John Paul II in 2000 declared him the heavenly patron of statesmen and politicians. Since 1980, the Church of England has remembered More liturgically as a Reformation martyr. The Soviet Union honored him for the purportedly communist attitude toward property rights expressed in Utopia. Topic: Early life. Born in Milk Street in London on the 7th of February 1478, Thomas More was the son of Sir John More, a successful lawyer and later a judge, and his wife Agnes Negronger. He was the second of six children. Moore was educated at St. Anthony's School, then considered one of London's finest schools. From 1490 to 1492, Moore served John Morton, the Archbishop of Canterbury and Lord Chancellor of England, as a household page. Morton enthusiastically supported the New Learning scholarship which was later known as Humanism, or London Humanism, and thought highly of the young Moore. Believing that Moore had great potential, Morton nominated him for a place at the University of Oxford either in St. Mary Hall or Canterbury College, both now gone. Moore began his studies at Oxford in 1492, and received a classical education. Studying under Thomas Lineker and William Grosson, he became proficient in both Latin and Greek. Moore left Oxford after only two years—at his father's insistence—to begin legal training in London at New Inn, one of the inns of Chancery. In 1496, Moore became a student at Lincoln's Inn, one of the inns of court, where he remained until 1502, when he was called to the bar. Topic. Spiritual life According to his friend, theologian Desiderius Erasmus of Rotterdam, Moore once seriously contemplated abandoning his legal career to become a monk. Between 1503 and 1504 Moore lived near the Carthusian monastery outside the walls of London and joined in the monks' spiritual exercises. Although he deeply admired their piety, Moore ultimately decided to remain a layman, standing for election to Parliament in 1504 and marrying the following year. Moore continued ascetic practices for the rest of his life, such as wearing a hair shirt next to his skin and occasionally engaging in flagellation. A tradition of the Third Order of St. Francis honors Moore as a member of that order on their calendar of saints. <laughs> <laughs> Family life Moore married Jane Colt in 1505. Erasmus reported that Moore wanted to give his young wife a better education than she had previously received at home, and tutored her in music and literature. The couple had four children before Jane died in 1511, Margaret, Elizabeth, Cicely, and John, going, "...against friends' advice and common custom." Within thirty days Moore had married one of the many eligible women among his wide circle of friends. He chose Alice Harper Middleton to head his household and care for his small children. The speed of the marriage was so unusual that Moore had to get a dispensation of the bans, which, due to his good public reputation, he easily obtained. Moore had no children from his second marriage, although he raised Alice's daughter from her previous marriage as his own. Moore also became the guardian of two young girls. Anne Cresacre would eventually marry his son, John Moore, and Margaret Giggs later Clement would be the only member of his family to witness his execution. She died on the 35th anniversary of that execution, and her daughter married Moore's nephew William Rastel. 
An affectionate father, Moore wrote letters to his children whenever he was away on legal or government business, and encouraged them to write to him often. Moore insisted upon giving his daughters the same classical education as his son, a highly unusual attitude at the time. His eldest daughter, Margaret, attracted much admiration for her erudition, especially her fluency in Greek and Latin. Moore told his daughter of his pride in her academic accomplishment in September 1522, after he showed the bishop a letter she had written. When he saw from the signature that it was the letter of a lady, his surprise led him to read it more eagerly. He said he would never have believed it to be your work unless I had assured him of the fact, and he began to praise it in the highest terms, for its pure latinity, its correctness, its erudition, and its expressions of tender affection. He took out at once from his pocket a portog, a Portuguese gold coin, to send to you as a pledge and token of his goodwill towards you. Moore's decision to educate his daughters set an example for other noble families. Even Erasmus became much more favorable once he witnessed their accomplishments. A portrait of Moore and his family was painted by Holbein, but it was lost in a fire in the 18th century. Moore's grandson commissioned a copy, of which two versions survive. Topic: <laughs> Early political career. In 1504 Moore was elected to Parliament to represent Great Yarmouth, and in 1510 began representing London. From 1510, Moore served as one of the two undersheriffs of the City of London, a position of considerable responsibility in which he earned a reputation as an honest and effective public servant. Moore became Master of Requests in 1514, the same year in which he was appointed as a privy councillor. After undertaking a diplomatic mission to the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V, accompanying Thomas Wolsey, Cardinal Archbishop of York, to Calais and Bruges, Moore was knighted and made under Treasurer of the Exchequer in 1521. As secretary and personal advisor to King Henry VIII, Moore became increasingly influential, welcoming foreign diplomats, drafting official documents, and serving as a liaison between the King and Lord Chancellor Wolsey. Moore later served as High Steward for the Universities of Oxford and Cambridge. In 1523 Moore was elected as Knight of the Shire MP for Middlesex and, on Wolsey's recommendation, the House of Commons elected Moore its Speaker. In 1525 Moore became Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, with executive and judicial responsibilities over much of northern England. Chancellorship <laughs> 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 After Wolsey fell, Moore succeeded to the office of Lord Chancellor in 1529. He dispatched cases with unprecedented rapidity. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Campaign against the Protestant Reformation. Moore supported the Catholic Church and saw the Protestant Reformation as heresy, a threat to the unity of both church and society. Moore believed in the theology, argumentation, and ecclesiastical laws of the Church, and heard Luther's call to destroy the Catholic Church as a call to war. His early actions against the Protestant Reformation included aiding Wolsey in preventing Lutheran books from being imported into England, spying on and investigating suspected Protestants, especially publishers, and arresting anyone holding in his possession, transporting, or selling the books of the Protestant Reformation. Moore vigorously suppressed Tyndale's English translation of the New Testament. The Tyndale Bible used controversial translations of certain words that Moore considered heretical and seditious, for example, it used senior and elder rather than priest for the Greek presbyteros, and used the term congregation instead of church. He also pointed out that some of the marginal glosses challenged Catholic doctrine. It was during this time that most of his literary polemics appeared. Rumors circulated during and after Moore's lifetime regarding ill treatment of heretics during his time as Lord Chancellor. The popular anti Catholic polemicist John Fox, who placed Protestant sufferings against the background of the Antichrist, was instrumental in publicizing accusations of torture in his famous Book of Martyrs, claiming that Moore had often personally used violence or torture while interrogating heretics. Later authors such as Brian Moynihan and Michael Ferris cite Fox when repeating these allegations. Peter Aykroyd also lists claims from Fox's Book of Martyrs and other post-Reformation sources that Moore tied heretics to a tree in his Chelsea garden and whipped them. That he watched as new men were put upon the rack in the tower and tortured until they confessed. 
and that he was personally responsible for the burning of several of the brethren in Smithfield. Richard Marius records a similar claim, which tells about James Bainham, and writes that the story Fox told of Bainham's whipping and racking at Moore's hands is universally doubted today. Moore himself denied these allegations. Stories of a similar nature were current even in Moore's lifetime and he denied them forcefully. He admitted that he did imprison heretics in his house their sure keping, he called it, but he utterly rejected claims of torture and whipping. As help me God. Moore, however, writes in his Apology, 1533, that he only applied corporal punishment to two heretics, a child who was caned in front of his family for heresy regarding the Eucharist, and a feeble-minded man who was whipped for disrupting prayers. During Moore's chancellorship, six people were burned at the stake for heresy, they were Thomas Hitton, Thomas Bilney, Richard Bayfield, John Tewkesbury, Thomas Dusgate, and James Bainham. Moynihan has claimed that Moore was influential in the burning of Tyndale, as Moore's agents had long pursued him, even though this took place over a year after his own death. Burning at the stake had long been a standard punishment for heresy, about thirty burnings had taken place in the century before Moore's elevation to Chancellor, and burning continued to be used by both Catholics and Protestants during the religious upheaval of the following decades. Ackroyd notes that Moore approved of burning. Marius maintains that Moore did everything in his power to bring about the extermination of heretics but not that Moore was personally active in burning them. John Tewkesbury was a London leather seller found guilty by Bishop of London John Stokesley of harbouring banned books. He was sentenced to burning for refusing to recant. Moore declared, he burned as there was noyer wretch I ween better worthy. After Richard Bayfield was executed for selling heretical books, Moore commented that he was well and worthily burned. Modern commentators are divided over Moore's religious actions as Chancellor. Some biographers, including Ackroyd, have taken a relatively tolerant view of Moore's campaign against Protestantism by placing his actions within the turbulent religious climate of the time and the threat of deadly catastrophes such as the German Peasants' Revolt which Moore blamed on Luther, as did many others, such as Erasmus. Others have been more critical, such as Richard Marius, an American scholar of the Reformation, believing that persecutions were a betrayal of Moore's earlier humanist convictions, including Moore's zealous and well documented advocacy of extermination for Protestants. Some Protestants take a different view. In 1980, Moore was added to the Church of England's calendar of saints and heroes of the Christian Church, despite being a fierce opponent of the English Reformation that created the Church of England. He was added jointly with John Fisher, to be commemorated every 6 July the date of Moore's execution as Thomas Moore, Scholar, and John Fisher, Bishop of Rochester, Reformation Martyrs, 1535. Pope John Paul II honored him by making him patron saint of statesmen and politicians in October 2000, stating, It can be said that he demonstrated in a singular way the value of a moral conscience, even if, in his actions against heretics, he reflected the limits of the culture of his time. Resignation As the conflict over supremacy between the papacy and the king reached its apogee, Moore continued to remain steadfast in supporting the supremacy of the pope as successor of Peter over that of the king of England. Parliament's reinstatement of the charge of premunire in 1529 had made it a crime to support in public or office the claim of any authority outside the realm such as the papacy to have a legal jurisdiction superior to the king's. In 1530, Moore refused to sign a letter by the leading English churchmen and aristocrats asking Pope Clement VII to annul Henry's marriage to Catherine of Aragon, and also quarreled with Henry VIII over the heresy laws. In 1531, a royal decree required the clergy to take an oath acknowledging the king as supreme head of the church in England. The bishops at the Convocation of Canterbury in 1532 agreed to sign the oath but only under threat of premunire and only after these words were added, as far as Christ law allows. This was considered to be the final submission of the clergy. Cardinal John Fisher and some other clergy refused to sign. Henry purged most clergy who supported the papal stance from senior positions in the church. Moore continued to refuse to sign the oath of supremacy and did not agree to support the annulment of Henry's marriage to Catherine. 
However, he did not openly reject the king's actions and kept his opinions private. On the 16th of May 1532, Moore resigned from his role as chancellor but remained in Henry's favor in spite of his refusal. His decision to resign was caused by the decision of the convocation of the English church, which was under intense royal threat on the day before. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Indictment, trial and execution. In 1533, Moore refused to attend the coronation of Anne Boleyn as the Queen of England. Technically, this was not an act of treason, as Moore had written to Henry seemingly acknowledging Anne's queenship and expressing his desire for the king's happiness and the new queen's health. Despite this, his refusal to attend was widely interpreted as a snub against Anne, and Henry took action against him. Shortly thereafter, Moore was charged with accepting bribes, but the charges had to be dismissed for lack of any evidence. In early 1534, Moore was accused by Thomas Cromwell of having given advice and counsel to the Holy Maid of Kent, Elizabeth Barton, a nun who had prophesied that the king had ruined his soul and would come to a quick end for having divorced Queen Catherine. This was a month after Barton had confessed, which was possibly done under royal pressure, and was said to be concealment of treason, though it was dangerous for anyone to have anything to do with Barton. Moore had indeed met with her, and was impressed by her fervor. But Moore was prudent and told her not to interfere with state matters. Moore was called before a committee of the Privy Council to answer these charges of treason, and after his respectful answers the matter seemed to be dropped. On 13 April 1534, Moore was asked to appear before a commission and swear his allegiance to the Parliamentary Act of Succession. Moore accepted Parliament's right to declare Anne Boleyn the legitimate Queen of England, though he refused the spiritual validity of the King's second marriage. And, holding fast to the teaching of papal supremacy, he steadfastly refused to take the oath of supremacy of the crown in the relationship between the kingdom and the church in England. Moore furthermore publicly refused to uphold Henry's annulment from Catherine. John Fisher, Bishop of Rochester, refused the oath along with Moore. The oath reads, by reason whereof the Bishop of Rome and see Apostolic, contrary to the great and inviolable grants of jurisdictions given by God immediately to emperors, kings and princes in succession to their heirs, hath presumed in times past to invest who should please them to inherit in other men's kingdoms and dominions, which thing we your most humble subjects, both spiritual and temporal, do most abhor and detest. In addition to refusing to support the king's annulment or supremacy, Moore refused to sign the 1534 Oath of Succession confirming Anne's role as queen and the rights of their children to succession. Moore's fate was sealed. While he had no argument with the basic concept of succession as stated in the Act, the preamble of the oath repudiated the authority of the Pope, his enemies had enough evidence to have the king arrest him on treason. Four days later, Henry had Moore imprisoned in the Tower of London. Their more prepared a devotional dialogue of comfort against tribulation. While Moore was imprisoned in the Tower, Thomas Cromwell made several visits, urging Moore to take the oath, which he continued to refuse. The charges of high treason related to Moore's violating the statutes as to the king's supremacy malicious silence and conspiring with Bishop John Fisher in this respect malicious conspiracy and, according to some sources, for asserting that Parliament did not have the right to proclaim the king's supremacy over the English Church. One group of scholars believes that the judges dismissed the first two charges malicious acts and tried more only on the final one but others strongly disagree regardless of the specific charges the indictment related to violation of the treasons act 1534 which declared it treason to speak against the king's supremacy if any person or persons, after the first day of February next coming, do maliciously wish, will or desire, by words or writing, or by craft imagine, invent, practice, or attempt any bodily harm to be done or committed to the king's most royal person, the queen's, or their heirs apparent, or to deprive them or any of them of their dignity, title, or name of their royal estates. That then every such person and person so offending, shall have and suffer such pains of death and other penalties, as is limited and accustomed in cases of high treason. The trial was held on 1 July 1535, before a panel of judges that included the new Lord Chancellor, Sir Thomas Audley, as well as Anne Boleyn's father, brother, and uncle. More, relying upon legal precedent and the maxim, Qui tacit consentire viditor. One who keeps silent seems to consent. 
understood that he could not be convicted as long as he did not explicitly deny that the king was supreme head of the church, and he therefore refused to answer all questions regarding his opinions on the subject. Thomas Cromwell, at the time the most powerful of the king's advisers, brought forth Solicitor General Richard Rich to testify that Moore had, in his presence, denied that the king was the legitimate head of the church. This testimony was characterized by Moore as being extremely dubious. Witnesses Richard Southwell and Mr. Palmer both denied having heard the details of the reported conversation, and as Moore himself pointed out, Can it therefore seem likely to your lordships, that I should in so weighty an affair as this, act so unadvisedly, as to trust Mr. Rich, a man I had always so mean an opinion of, in reference to his truth and honesty, that I should only impart to Mr. Rich the secrets of my conscience in respect to the king's supremacy, the particular secrets, and only point about which I have been so long pressed to explain myself, which I never did, nor never would reveal, when the act was once made, either to the king himself, or any of his privy councillors, as is well known to your honours, who have been sent upon no other account at several times by his majesty to me in the tower. I refer it to your judgments, my lords, whether this can seem credible to any of your lordships. The jury took only fifteen minutes, however, to find Moore guilty. After the jury's verdict was delivered and before his sentencing, Moore spoke freely of his belief that, no temporal man may be the head of the spirituality, take over the role of the Pope. According to William Roper's account, Moore was pleading that the statute of supremacy was contrary to the Magna Carta, to church laws and to the laws of England, attempting to void the entire indictment against him. He was sentenced to be hanged, drawn, and quartered the usual punishment for traitors who were not the nobility, but the king commuted this to execution by decapitation. The execution took place on 6 July 1535. When he came to mount the steps to the scaffold, its frame seeming so weak that it might collapse, Moore is widely quoted as saying to one of the officials, I pray you, Master Lieutenant, see me safe up and for my coming down, let me shift for myself. While on the scaffold he declared that he died, the king's good servant, and God's first. After Moore had finished reciting the Miserere while kneeling, the executioner reportedly begged his pardon, then Moore rose up merrily, kissed him and gave him forgiveness. Topic. Relics Another comment he is believed to have made to the executioner is that his beard was completely innocent of any crime, and did not deserve the axe, he then positioned his beard so that it would not be harmed. Moore asked that his foster, adopted daughter Margaret Clement nay Giggs, be given his headless corpse to bury. She was the only member of his family to witness his execution. He was buried at the Tower of London, in the chapel of St. Peter ad Vincula in an unmarked grave. His head was fixed upon a pike over London Bridge for a month, according to the normal custom for traitors. Noor's daughter Margaret later rescued the severed head. It is believed to rest in the Roper Vault of St. Dunstan's Church, Canterbury, perhaps with the remains of Margaret and her husband's family. Some have claimed that the head is buried within the tomb erected for Moore in Chelsea Old Church, among other surviving relics is his hair shirt, presented for safekeeping by Margaret Clement. This was long in the custody of the community of Augustinian canonesses who until 1983 lived at the convent at Abbotskirswell Priory, Devon. Some sources, including one from 2004, claimed that the hair shirt was then at the Martyrs' Church on the Weld family's estate in Chidioc, Dorset. The most recent reports indicate that it is now preserved at Buckfast Abbey, near Buckfastley in Devon. Topic. Scholarly and literary work Topic. History of King Richard III Between 1512 and 1519 Moore worked on a history of King Richard III, which he never finished but which was published after his death. The history is a Renaissance biography, remarkable more for its literary skill and adherence to classical precepts than for its historical accuracy. Some consider it an attack on royal tyranny, rather than on Richard III himself or the House of York. Moore uses a more dramatic writing style than had been typical in medieval chronicles. Richard III is limned as an outstanding, archetypal tyrant. However, Moore was only seven years old when Richard III was killed at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485, so he had no first hand in depth knowledge of him. The history of King Richard III was written and published in both English and Latin, each written separately, and with information deleted from the Latin edition to suit a European readership. It greatly influenced William Shakespeare's play Richard III. 
Contemporary historians attribute the unflattering portraits of Richard III in both works to both authors' allegiance to the reigning Tudor dynasty that wrested the throne from Richard III in the Wars of the Roses. Moore's version barely mentions King Henry VII, the first Tudor king, perhaps because he had persecuted his father, Sir John Moore. Clements Markham suggests that the actual author of the work was Archbishop Morton and that Moore was simply copying or perhaps translating the work. Topic. Utopia Moore's best known and most controversial work, Utopia is a frame narrative written in Latin. Moore completed and theologian Erasmus published the book in Leuven in 1516, but it was only translated into English and published in his native land in 1551 16 years after his execution, and the 1684 translation became the most commonly cited. Moore also a character in the book and the narrator, traveller, Raphael Hythelodius whose name alludes both to the healer archangel Raphael, and speaker of nonsense, the surname's Greek meaning, discuss modern ills in Antwerp, as well as describe the political arrangements of the imaginary island country of Utopia a Greek pun on o topos no place and eu topos good place among themselves as well as to Peter Gillis and Hieronymus van Busleyden. Utopia's original edition included a symmetrical Utopian alphabet, omitted by later editions, but which may have been an early attempt or precursor of shorthand. Utopia contrasts the contentious social life of European states with the perfectly orderly, reasonable social arrangements of Utopia and its environs Taustoria, Nolandia, and Aircastle. In Utopia, there are no lawyers because of the law's simplicity and because social gatherings are in public view encouraging participants to behave well, communal ownership supplants private property, men and women are educated alike, and there is almost complete religious toleration except for atheists, who are allowed but despised. Moore may have used monastic communalism as his model, although other concepts such as legalizing euthanasia remain far outside church doctrine. Hythelodius asserts that a man who refuses to believe in a god or an afterlife could never be trusted, because he would not acknowledge any authority or principle outside himself. Some take the novel's principal message to be the social need for order and discipline rather than liberty. Ironically, Hythelodius, who believes philosophers should not get involved in politics, addresses Moore's ultimate conflict between his humanistic beliefs and courtly duties as the king's servant, pointing out that one day those morals will come into conflict with the political reality. Utopia gave rise to a literary genre, utopian and dystopian fiction, which features ideal societies or perfect cities, or their opposite. Early works influenced by Utopia included New Atlantis by Francis Bacon, Erifan by Samuel Butler, and Candide by Voltaire. Although Utopianism combined classical concepts of perfect societies Plato and Aristotle with Roman rhetorical finesse cf. Cicero, Quintilian, Epideictic Oratory, the Renaissance genre continued into the Age of Enlightenment and survives in modern science fiction. Topic. Religious polemics. In 1520 the reformer Martin Luther published three works in quick succession, an appeal to the Christian nobility of the German nation August, concerning the Babylonish captivity of the church October, and on the liberty of a Christian man November. In these books, Luther set out his doctrine of salvation through grace alone, rejected certain Catholic practices, and attacked abuses and excesses within the Catholic Church. In 1521, Henry VIII formally responded to Luther's criticisms with the Assertio, written with Moore's assistance. Pope Leo X rewarded the English king with the title Fide Defensor, Defender of the Faith, for his work combating Luther's heresies. Martin Luther then attacked Henry VIII in print, calling him a pig, dolt, and liar. At the king's request, Moore composed a rebuttal. The Responsio ad Lutherum was published at the end of 1523. In the Responsio, Moore defended papal supremacy, the sacraments, and other church traditions. Moore, though considered a much steadier personality, described Luther as an ape, a drunkard, and a lousy little friar, amongst other epithets. Writing under the pseudonym of Julius Rossus, Moore tells Luther that 
For as long as your reverend paternity will be determined to tell these shameless lies, others will be permitted, on behalf of his English majesty, to throw back into your paternity's shitty mouth, truly the shit pool of all shit, all the muck and shit which your damnable rottenness has vomited up, and to empty out all the sewers and privies onto your crown divested of the dignity of the priestly crown, against which no less than the kingly crown you have determined to play the buffoon, his saying is followed with a kind of apology to his readers, while Luther possibly never apologized for his sayings. Stephen Greenblatt argues, "...more speaks for his ruler and in his opponent's idiom, Luther speaks for himself, and his scatological imagery far exceeds in quantity, intensity, and inventiveness anything that more could muster. If for more scatology normally expresses a communal disapproval, for Luther, it expresses a deep personal rage." Confronting Luther confirmed Moore's theological conservatism. He thereafter avoided any hint of criticism of church authority. In 1528, Moore published another religious polemic, A Dialogue Concerning Heresies, that asserted the Catholic Church was the one true church, established by Christ and the Apostles, and affirmed the validity of its authority, traditions and practices. In 1529, the circulation of Simon Fish's supplication for the beggars prompted Moore to respond with the supplication of souls. In 1531, a year after Moore's father died, William Tyndale published an answer unto Sir Thomas More's dialogue in response to More's dialogue concerning heresies. More responded with a half million words, the confutation of Tyndale's answer. The confutation is an imaginary dialogue between More and Tyndale, with More addressing each of Tyndale's criticisms of Catholic rites and doctrines. More, who valued structure, tradition and order in society as safeguards against tyranny and error, vehemently believed that Lutheranism and the Protestant Reformation in general were dangerous, not only to the Catholic faith but to the stability of society as a whole. Correspondence Most major humanists were prolific letter writers, and Thomas More was no exception. As in the case of his friend Erasmus of Rotterdam, however, only a small portion of his correspondence about 280 letters survived. These include everything from personal letters to official government correspondence mostly in English, letters to fellow humanist scholars in Latin, several epistolary tracts, verse epistles, prefatory letters some fictional to several of Moore's own works, letters to Moore's children and their tutors in Latin, and the so-called prison letters in English which he exchanged with his oldest daughter Margaret while he was imprisoned in the Tower of London awaiting execution. Moore also engaged in controversies, most notably with the French poet Germain de Brie, which culminated in the publication of de Brie's Antimoris Erasmus intervened, however, and ended the dispute. Moore also wrote about more spiritual matters. They include, a treatise on the Passion a.k.a. Treatise on the Passion of Christ, a treatise to receive the Blessed Body a.k.a. Holy Body Treaty, and De Tristitia Christi a.k.a. The Agony of Christ. More handwrote the last which reads in the Tower of London while awaiting his execution. This last manuscript, saved from the confiscation decreed by Henry VIII, passed by the will of his daughter Margaret to Spanish hands through Fray Pedro de Soto, confessor of Emperor Charles V. Moore's friend Luis Vives received it in Valencia, where it remains in the collection of Real Colegio Seminario del Corpus Christi Museum. <laughs> Canonization <laughs> Roman Catholic Church Pope Leo XIII beatified Thomas More, John Fisher and 52 other English martyrs on 29 December 1886. Pope Pius XI canonized More and Fisher on 19 May 1935, and More's feast day was established as 9 July. Since 1970 the general Roman calendar has celebrated More with St. John Fisher on of June the date of Fisher's execution. On 31 October 2000 Pope John Paul II declared Moore, "...the heavenly patron of statesmen and politicians." Moore is the patron of the German Catholic youth organization Catholic Junge Gemeinde. <laughs> <laughs> Anglican Communion In 1980, despite their opposing the English Reformation, Moore and Fisher were jointly added as martyrs of the Reformation to the Church of England's calendar of Saints and Heroes of the Christian Church, to be commemorated every 6 July the date of Moore's execution as 
Thomas More, scholar, and John Fisher, Bishop of Rochester, Reformation Martyrs, 1535. More is also listed in the calendars of saints of some of the other churches in the Anglican Communion including The Anglican Church of Australia has July 6, John Fisher and Thomas More, Martyrs died 1535. The Anglican Church of Brazil has July 6, Thomas More, Martyr, 1535. The Anglican Church of Canada has July 6, Thomas More died 1535 commemoration in its Book of Alternative Services calendar, and has July 6, the octave day of St. Peter and St. Paul, and Thomas More, Chancellor of England, Martyr 1535, in the July section of its Book of Common Prayer calendar. The Anglican Church of Southern Africa has July 6, Thomas More, Martyr, 1535. Among those on which more is not listed are the calendars of the Episcopal Church in the United States, the Scottish Episcopal Church and the Anglican Church in Hong Kong and Macau. <laughs> Legacy The steadfastness and courage with which More maintained his religious convictions, and his dignity during his imprisonment, trial, and execution, contributed much to More's posthumous reputation, particularly among Roman Catholics. His friend Erasmus defended More's character as, "...more pure than any snow," and described his genius as, "...such as England never had and never again will have." Upon learning of More's execution, Emperor Charles V said, had we been master of such a servant, we would rather have lost the best city of our dominions than such a worthy counsellor." G. K. Chesterton, a Roman Catholic convert from the Church of England, predicted more, "...may come to be counted the greatest Englishman, or at least the greatest historical character in English history." Hugh Trevor Roper called more, the first great Englishman whom we feel that we know, the most saintly of humanists, the most human of saints, the universal man of our cool northern renaissance." Jonathan Swift, an Anglican, wrote that Moore was, "...a person of the greatest virtue this kingdom ever produced." Some consider Samuel Johnson that quotes author, although neither his writings nor Boswell's contain such. The metaphysical poet John Donne, also honored as a saint by Anglicans, was More's great-great-nephew, while Roman Catholic scholars maintain that More used irony in Utopia, and that he remained an Orthodox Christian. Marxist theoretician Karl Kautsky considered the book a shrewd critique of economic and social exploitation in pre-modern Europe. More thus is claimed to have influenced the development of socialist ideas. Topic: <laughs> Communism, Socialism, and Resistance to Communism. Having been praised as a communist hero by Karl Marx, Friedrich Engels, and Karl Kautsky, because of the communist attitude to property in his utopia, under Soviet communism the name of Thomas More was in ninth position from the top of Moscow's Steel of Freedom, also known as the Obelisk of Revolutionary Thinkers, as one of the most influential thinkers, who promoted the liberation of humankind from oppression, arbitrariness, and exploitation. This monument was erected in 1918 in Alexandrovsky Garden near the Kremlin at Lenin's suggestion. It was dismantled on 2 July 2013. During Vladimir Putin's third term as president of post communist Russia, Utopia also inspired socialists such as William Morris. Many see Moore's communism or socialism as purely satirical. In 1888, while praising Moore's communism, Karl Kautsky pointed out that, perplexed, Historians and economists often saw the name utopia which means no place as a subtle hint by Moore that he himself regarded his communism as an impracticable dream. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the Russian Nobel Prize winning anti-communist author, survivor and historian of the Soviet Gulag system, argued that Soviet communism needed enslavement and forced labor to survive, and that this had been Foreseen as far back as Thomas More, in his Utopia. In 2008, More was portrayed on stage in Hong Kong as an allegorical symbol of the pan democracy camp resisting Chinese communism in a translated and modified version of Robert Bolt's play A Man for All Seasons. <laughs> <laughs> Literature and popular culture William Roper's biography of Moore was one of the first biographies in modern English. 
Sir Thomas More is a play written circa 1592 in collaboration with Henry Chettle, Anthony Munday, William Shakespeare, and others. In it More is portrayed as a wise and honest statesman. The original manuscript has survived as a handwritten text that shows many revisions by its several authors, as well as the censorious influence of Edmund Tylney, master of the revels in the government of Queen Elizabeth I. The script has since been published and has had several productions. The 20th century agnostic playwright Robert Bolt portrayed Thomas More as the tragic hero of his 1960 play A Man for All Seasons. The title is drawn from what Robert Whittington in 1520 wrote of More. More is a man of an angel's wit and singular learning. I know not his fellow. For where is the man of that gentleness, lowliness and affability? And, as time requireth, a man of marvelous mirth and pastimes, and sometime of a sad gravity. A man for all seasons. In 1966, the play, A Man for All Seasons, was adapted into a film with the same title. It was directed by Fred Zinnemann and adapted for the screen by the playwright. It stars Paul Schofield, a noted British actor, who said that the part of Sir Thomas More was the most difficult part one played. The film won the Academy Award for Best Picture and Schofield won the Best Actor Oscar. In 1988 Charlton Heston starred in and directed a made-for-television film that restored the character of the common man that had been cut from the 1966 film. Catholic science fiction writer R. A. Lafferty wrote his novel Past Master as a modern equivalent to More's Utopia, which he saw as a satire. In this novel, Thomas More travels through time to the year 2535, where he is made king of the world, Astrobe, only to be beheaded after ruling for a mere nine days. One character compares more favorably to almost every other major historical figure. He had one completely honest moment right at the end. I cannot think of anyone else who ever had one." Carl Zuckart's novel, Sturb du Narr, Die You Fool, about Moore's struggle with King Henry, portrays Moore as an idealist bound to fail in the power struggle with a ruthless ruler and an unjust world. The novelist Hilary Mantle portrays Moore as an unsympathetic persecutor of Protestants, and an ally of the Habsburg Empire, in her 2009 novel Wolf Hall, told from the perspective of a sympathetically portrayed Thomas Cromwell. Literary critic James Wood in his book The Broken Estate, a collection of essays, is critical of Moore and refers to him as "...cruel in punishment, evasive in argument, lusty for power, and repressive in politics." Aaron Zellman's non-fiction book The State vs. the People includes a comparison of utopia with Plato's Republic. Zellman is undecided as to whether Moore was being ironic in his book or was genuinely advocating a police state. Zellman comments. Moore is the only Christian saint to be honored with a statue at the Kremlin. By this Zelman implies that Utopia influenced Vladimir Lenin's Bolsheviks, despite their brutal repression of religion. Other biographers, such as Peter Ackroyd, have offered a more sympathetic picture of Moore as both a sophisticated philosopher and man of letters, as well as a zealous Catholic who believed in the authority of the Holy See over Christendom. The protagonist of Walker Percy's novels, Love in the Ruins and the Thanatos Syndrome, is Dr. Thomas More, a reluctant Catholic and descendant of More. More is the focus of the Al Stewart song, A Man for All Seasons, from the 1978 album Time Passages, and of the Far song, Sir, featured on the limited editions and 2008 re-release of their 1994 album Quick. In addition, the song, So Says I, by indie rock outfit The Shins alludes to the socialist interpretation of Moore's Utopia. Jeremy Northam depicts Moore in the television series The Tudors as a peaceful man, as well as a devout Roman Catholic and loving family patriarch. He also shows Moore loathing Protestantism, burning both Martin Luther's books and English Protestants who have been convicted of heresy. The portrayal has unhistorical aspects, such as that Moore neither personally caused nor attended Simon Fish's execution since Fish actually died of bubonic plague in 1531 before he could stand trial, although Moore's The Supplicatian of Solis, published in October 1529, addressed Fish's supplication for the beggars. Indeed, there is no evidence that Moore ever attended the execution of any heretic. The series also neglected to show Moore's avowed insistence that Richard Rich's testimony about Moore disputing the king's title as supreme head of the Church of England was perjured. In 2002, Moore was placed at number 37 in the BBC's poll of the 100 Greatest Britons.
Topic: <laughs> Institutions named after Moore. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Historic sites. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Westminster Hall. A plaque in the middle of the floor of London's Westminster Hall commemorates Moore's trial for treason and condemnation to execution in that original part of the Palace of Westminster. The building, which houses Parliament, would have been well known to Moore, who served several terms as a member and became Speaker of the House of Commons before his appointment as England's Lord Chancellor. Topic. Crosby Hall The Crown confiscated Moore's home and estate along the Thames in Chelsea after his execution. Crosby Hall, which was part of Moore's London residence, was eventually relocated and reconstructed in Chelsea by conservation architect Walter Godfrey in 1910. Rebuilt in the 1990s, the white stone building stands amid modern brick structures that attempt to recapture the style of Moore's former manor on the site. Crosby Hall is privately owned and closed to the public. The modern structures face the Thames and include an entryway that displays Moore's arms, heraldic beasts, and a Latin maxim. Apartment buildings and a park cover the former gardens and orchard. Roper's Garden is the park atop one of Moore's gardens, sunken as his was believed to be. No other remnants exist of the Moore estate. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Chelsea Old Church. Across a small park in Old Church Street from Crosby Hall is Chelsea Old Church, an Anglican church whose southern chapel Moore commissioned and in which he sang with the parish choir. Except for his chapel, the church was largely destroyed in the Second World War and rebuilt in 1958. The capitals on the medieval arch connecting the chapel to the main sanctuary display symbols associated with Moore and his office. On the southern wall of the sanctuary is the tomb and epitaph he erected for himself and his wives, detailing his ancestry and accomplishments in Latin, including his role as peacemaker between the Christian nations of Europe as well as a curiously altered portion about his curbing heresy. When Moore served Mass, he would leave by the door just to the left of it. He is not, however, buried here, nor is it entirely certain which of his family may be. It is open to the public at specific times. Outside the church, facing the River Thames, is a statue by L. Cubitt Bevis erected in 1969, commemorating Moore as saint, scholar, and statesman. The back displays his coat of arms. Nearby, on Upper Shane Row, the Roman Catholic Church of Our Most Holy Redeemer and St. Thomas More honors the martyr. Topic Tower Hill A plaque and small garden commemorate the famed execution site on Tower Hill, London, just outside the Tower of London, as well as all those executed there, many as religious martyrs or as prisoners of conscience. Moore's corpse, minus his head, was unceremoniously buried in an unmarked mass grave beneath the Royal Chapel of St. Peter ad Vincula, within the walls of the Tower of London, as was the custom for traitors executed at Tower Hill. The chapel is accessible to Tower visitors. St. Catherine Docks Thomas More is commemorated by a stone plaque near St. Catherine Docks, just east of the tower where he was executed. The street in which it is situated was formerly called Nightingale Lane, a corruption of Knighton Guild, derived from the original owners of the land. It is now renamed Thomas More Street in his honor. St. Dunstan's Church and Roper House, Canterbury St. Dunstan's Church, an Anglican parish church in Canterbury, possesses Moore's head, rescued by his daughter Margaret Roper, whose family lived in Canterbury down and across the street from their parish church. A stone immediately to the left of the altar marks the sealed Roper family vault beneath the Nicholas Chapel, itself to the right of the church's sanctuary or main altar. St. Dunstan's Church has carefully investigated, preserved and sealed this burial vault. The last archaeological investigation revealed that the suspected head of Moore rests in a niche separate from the other bodies, possibly from later interference. Displays in the chapel record the archaeological findings in pictures and narratives. Roman Catholics donated stained glass to commemorate the events in Moore's life. A small plaque marks the former home of William and Margaret Roper, another house nearby and entitled Roper House is now a home for the deaf. 
Topic works note: The reference CW is to the relevant volume of the Yale edition of the Complete Works of Saint Thomas More, New Haven and London, 1963 to 1997. Topic published during More's life, with dates of publication: A Merry Jest, C. 1516, CW1, Utopia, 1516, CW4, Latin Poems, 1518, 1520, CW3, PT.2, Letter to Bryxius, 1520, CW3, PT.2, Apps. C. Responsio ad Lutherum, The Answer to Luther, 1523. CW5, A Dialogue Concerning Heresies, 1529, 1530. CW6, Supplication of Souls, 1529. CW7, Letter Against Frith, 1532. CW7, The Confutation of Tyndall's Answer, 1532, 1533. CW8, Apology, 1533. CW9, Debilation of Salem and Byzance, 1533. CW10. The Answer to a Poisoned Book, 1533. CW11, Topic Published After Moore's Death, with likely dates of composition. The History of King Richard III, c. 1513 to 1518. CW2 and 15. The Four Last Things, c. 1522, CW 1, A Dialogue of Comfort Against Tribulation, 1534, CW 12, Treatise Upon the Passion, 1534, CW 13, Treatise on the Blessed Body, 1535, CW 13. Instructions and Prayers, 1535, CW 13, De Tristitia Christi, 1535, CW 14, preserved in the Real Colegio Seminario del Corpus Christi, Valencia. Topic translations, translations of Lucian, many dates, 1506 to 1534, CW 3, PT.1, The Life of Pico della Mirandola, by John Francesco Pico della Mirandola, C. 1510, CW 1. Topic C. Also English Reformation Moriana. Topic Topic notes topic Biographies Ackroyd, Peter The Life of Thomas More. Bassett, Bernard, S.J. 1965. Born for Friendship, The Spirit of Sir Thomas More. London, Burns and Oates. Burglar, Peter 2009. Thomas More, A Lonely Voice Against the Power of the State. New York, Scepter Publishers. ISBN 978-1-59417-073-7. Note, this is a 2009 translation from the original German, by Hector de Cavilla of Burglar's 1978 work Die Stunde de Thomas Morris, Einer gegen die Macht. Freiburg 1978, Adamas Verlag, Köln 1998, ISBN 3-925746-78-1. Brady, Charles A. 1953. Stage of Fools, a novel of Sir Thomas More. Dutton. Bremond, Henri Le Binero Thomas More 1478-1535 as Sir Thomas More 1913, translated by Henry Child, 1920 edition published by R&T Washbourne Limited, OCLC 1224822, 749 paperback edition by Kessinger Publishing, LLC the 26th of May 2006 6 with ISBN 1-4286-1904-6, ISBN 978-1-4286-1904-3, published in French in Paris by Gabalda, 1920, OCLC 369064822 Note, Bremond is frequently cited in Burglar 2009, Chambers, R.W. 1935. Thomas More. Harcourt, Brace. Guy, John 1980. The Public Career of Sir Thomas More. ISBN 978-0-300-02546-0. 2000. Thomas More. ISBN 978-0-340-73138-3. 2009. A Daughter's Love, Thomas More and His Daughter Meg. House, Seymour B. 2008-2004. More, Thomas. Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, online ed. Oxford University Press. doi. 10. 1093, ref. ODNB, 19191, subscription or UK public library membership required. Marius, Richard, 1984. Thomas More, A Biography 1999. Thomas More, A Biography. Harvard University Press. ISBN 978-0-674-88525-7. Moore, Kresaker, 1828. 
The Life of Sir Thomas More by His Great Grandson. Filippo, Marie Claire. 2016. Thomas More. Gallimard. Reynolds, E. 1964. The Trialet of St. Thomas More. 1965. Thomas More and Erasmus. Ridley, Jasper. 1983. Statesman and Saint, Cardinal Wolsey, Sir Thomas More, and the Politics of Henry VIII. ISBN 0 670 48905 0. Roper, William. 2003, Wegmer, Gerard B., Smith, Stephen W., eds. The Life of Sir Thomas More. 1556 PDF, Center for Thomas More Studies. Stapleton, Thomas, The Life and Illustrious Martyrdom of Sir Thomas More. 1588 PDF. Wegmer, Gerard. 1985. Thomas More, A Portrait of Courage. ISBN 978 1 889334 12 7. 1996, Thomas More on Statesmanship. Topic. Historiography Gushurst Moore, Andre. A Man for All Eras Recent Books on Thomas More. Political Science Reviewer, 33 90 143. Guy, John. The Search for the Historical Thomas More. History Review, 15. Topic. Primary sources Moore, Thomas 1963 Yale edition of the complete works of St. Thomas More, New Haven and London Amazon links. 2010, Logan, George M., Adams, Robert M., eds., Utopia, Critical Editions 3rd ed., Norton. 2003, Thornton, John F., ed., St. Thomas More, Selected Writings, 2001, Da Silva, Alvaro, ed., The Last Letters of Thomas More 2004, Wegmer, Gerald B., Smith, Stephen W., eds., A Thomas More Source Book, Catholic University of America Press Topic. External links Archival material relating to Thomas More. UK National Archives Portraits of Sir Thomas More at the National Portrait Gallery, London The Center for Thomas More Studies at the University of Dallas Thomas More Studies Database, contains several of More's English works, including dialogues, early poetry and letters, as well as journal articles and biographical material Works by Thomas More at Project Gutenberg Works by or about Thomas More at Internet Archive Works by Thomas More at LibriVox Public Domain Audiobooks Wood, James, Sir Thomas More, A Man for One Season essay. Presents a critical view of More's anti-Protestantism More and the History of Richard III Kautsky, Karl, Thomas More and His Utopia, Marxists. Thomas More and Utopias, a learning resource from the British Library Wegmer, Gerard, Integrity and Conscience in the Life and Thought of Thomas More. Herberman, Charles, ed. 1913. Street. Thomas More. Catholic Encyclopedia. New York, Robert Appleton Company. Patron Saints Index Entry, St. Thomas More Biography, Prayers, Quotes, Catholic Devotions to Him. Trial of Sir Thomas More at the University of Missouri Kansas City UMKC School of Law. John Fisher and Thomas More, Martyrs of England and Wales St. Thomas More at Library of Congress Authorities, with 186 catalogue records. <laughs>